ghost stories. If there's one thing that's always fascinated me, it's creepy stories about things that go bump in the night. While I'm no horror connoisseur, I do love settling in for some spooky content. Whether it's one of those ghost hunting shows, some animated creepypasta, or in today's case, spooky Thomas and Friends episodes. Ghost stories and Thomas and Friends have a special place in my heart as they're able to give the perfect atmosphere for a scary episode without making me dye my pants a viscous shade of brown. And it should come as no surprise that the Thomas fandom has literal bucket loads of Halloween and ghost themed episodes right for the picking. So today I'll be looking at and reviewing like way too many of them. Going in no particular order, I'll be taking a look at Ghost Train, Stepney Gets Lost, Scaredy Engines, Halloween, Ghosts, Night Train to Vickerstown, Revenge of the Ghost Train, Engine 17, Silent as the Grave, A Part of Me Stayed Behind, The Half Engine, and finally, All Eyes on Dennis. So, with all that out of the way, let's begin, starting with Ghost Train, original release, 1972 and 1986. This is the only story on this list to be written by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey, with art done by Gunver and Peter Edwards. It also just so happens to be one of the last stories the trio would take part in, as Tramway Engines was the final book of the original Railway series before Christopher Audrey took over. This story would eventually be brought to model life in 1986, being the anti-penultimate episode of Season 2. And as such, the story is... well, simple to say the least. We pick things up with Percy telling Thomas and Toby about a ghost train his driver saw, though Thomas is hardly impressed. Percy, what are you talking about? The ghost train. Driver saw it last night. Where? asked Thomas and Toby. He didn't say. Oh, it makes my wheels wobble to think of it. Ha! Huh, said Thomas. You're just a silly little engine. I'm not scared. The wind is further taken out of Percy's sails when his driver tells him that the ghost he'd saw was only one on television. Probably from one of those super ultra fake ghost hunting shows. Not Ghost Adventures though, Ghost Adventures is baller. Is your mask on? No. <laughs> Anyways, that evening, while returning back from a hard day's work, Percy collides head-on with a stranded lime cart, coating himself from funnel to footplate in white powder. And as someone whose job involves fetching bags of limestone, I can attest that this is 100% accurate. Shit's like glitter, it gets everywhere. Regardless, Percy and his crew carry on to the next junction and tell the signalman what happened. I'll see to it, but you'd better clean Percy, or people will think he's a ghost. And so, the plan is arranged. Toby trundles off to act as the harbinger of sorts, and moments later, Percy shows up to scare the hell out of Thomas. Let me in, let me in, not by the smoke of my chimney chim chim. I'll chaff and I'll puff and I'll break your door in. Oh. Next day, the little blue engine runs into Toby again, and depending on the version, either runs off out of embarrassment, or because he really does think the ghost is still after him, leaving Percy and Toby to laugh it up. As I said, this is a very simple, digestible story. There's no greater meaning, there's no big revelations, it's just three guys being dudes. And though the simplicity of this story didn't give me much to chew on upon revisiting, it's still very special to me. This is the first Thomas story I ever watched. I still have the VHS tape it came on, and as an introduction to the series, dang was this perfect. Everything looks scary, but the situation is actually very safe. There's no moment where a child would need to cover their eyes, unless the sight of Percy's mug here is scary to you. Your ugly fizz is enough to frighten anyone. This was the story to start my fascination with the series, for better or worse, and it's definitely a gem that I'm happy to come back to. And credit where credit is due, while simplistic, this story does show off each of the three main boyos pretty well. Thomas is the killjoy, only to get caught with his pants down, Percy's the naive, wide-eyed underdog, and Toby's the wise old man who can't help but laugh as he watches the youngins squabble. It also helps that the presentation for this episode is exceptional. This was the first time to my knowledge that David Minton and Friends made a spooky episode, and they absolutely nailed the aesthetics. That opening shot on the viaduct alone is already a winner, but the music, the wispy looking engine that's totally just Percy in a trench coat, but shh, it's a striking way to start off an episode. But even the daytime shots look great, with smoke filling the air to give that same sense of spookiness, even when day is considered the safe time in these sorts of stories. As far as narration goes, George Carlin is great, yeah, but I have to give a round of applause to Ringo Starr. He totally nailed this episode. There's no awkward, way too long pauses, and they finally gave him some coffee so he doesn't sound like he just got out of a coma.
While I wouldn't call Ghost Train my absolute favorite ghost story, since, well, there's no ghost, it's still a good one, no doubt about that. Next up to bat, Step Me Gets Lost. Original release, 1998. Across all my videos, I think this is actually the first time I'm spotlighting an episode from Season 5. That's not to say I don't like this batch, far from it. Even with all the Season 6 simpery my body can muster, even I have to admit that Season 5 is, without question, the most technically impressive the show ever got. At least in the model era. This is the season everyone points to when they think of Thomas's biggest moments. And rightfully so. They went all in with making this season feel larger than life. From the visuals, to the music, and of course, the stories. Spooky stories in seasons 5 through 7 are sort of dime a dozen, but season 5 is really where they leaned into the darker aspects of Thomas. Well, as dark as you can get for a kid's show anyways. You've got the murderous boulder, that one time Henry almost died, the other time Henry almost died, that time Thomas tricked Toby into thinking he was about to die, and the time when an engine actually did die, oh fuck. Maybe those articles were onto something after all. But all those stories have been talked about before. And of course, me, being the champion of originality who would never dare to retread old ground, decided to go for something a little bit different. And besides, Stepney Gets Lost is a bit of a special case when it comes to scary Thomas stories, as I think it represents both the best and worst parts of the classic series' approach to telling stories. But first, how's about that plot summary? Stepney, for the second time in the series, is bored of working on the Bluebell Railway, the ungrateful ass. So, to placate him, Sir Topham Hatt decides to send him to work at the quarry on Thomas's branch line with Toby and Mavis, adding to be back by nightfall because, hey, the line gets dark at night and you might, like, crash. Wouldn't be the first time. Upon arriving at the quarry, Stepney sets right to work, impressing Mavis, Toby, and the quarry manager. The latter of whom asking if Stepney would like to take a midnight special to a work site. Stepney agrees, because why wouldn't he? And he sets out at nightfall. And can I just say, dang I love this sequence of Stepney delivering his train. It's so short, but the way it's shot is just, oh, I love it. And it's hardly the only set of great shots in here. After delivering his trucks, Stepney sets out for home, only for a thick fog to roll in. But hey, the signal's green, who needs to stop, right? The engine and his crew carry on down the line, accidentally taking a wrong turn that winds up sending them somewhere eerily familiar. And when the fog lifts, reality sets in. Oh no! We're in the scrapyards! Stepney's crew leave for help, forgetting to set Stepney's brakes, which is just... I'm sorry, but isn't that like the equivalent of leaving your keys in the ignition? It's an anxious wait for the Bluebell engine, and one that comes to an end not when his crew returns, but when a pair of diesels emerge from the shadows. They've just found their next victim. The two marshal Stepney into the smelting shed, taunting him as they back away to let a giant mechanical claw do... Well, no matter what it does, it's not gonna be good. But just as Stepney is about to actually fucking die, the guy controlling the grabber runs out of quarters- I mean Sir Topham Hatt arrives to save the day, stopping the workmen from scrapping Stepney. And then Stepney leaves. The end. Okay, I know it sounds like I'm giving the story shit, but I really do like the majority of this episode. It's paced perfectly, there's no wasted motion, it follows the conventions of good horror where we start in a safe place and then slowly transition to more dangerous territory, only for things to really ramp up at the climax, and then... the ending stumbles in with all the class of someone farting at a eulogy. I don't want this to become another trucks tangent, but this kind of writing is... not good. It's true that in the world of literature, you kind of have to just accept that little random happenstances will be there no matter what. That's just how the world works. Things do happen out of the blue, sometimes to our detriment or perhaps our benefit. And it's totally possible to write those kinds of things into a story to improve it. Heck, the episode did just that when Stepney was traveling home with the fog and the points. But to have your climax come down to one of these random little out of the blue moments is just poor storytelling. Something like this is what we call a deus ex machina. The protagonist is met with an insurmountable challenge, in this case, the claw, and then boom, said insurmountable challenge is taken care of by the exact thing that could stop it at the last possible second. This kind of thing isn't exclusive to this story either. While I wouldn't say it's terribly common, you'll still find instances of this in the Railway series, the CGI series, and I'll bet my left testicle it happens in All Engines Go. Now you might be asking, well, what's the difference between this and say, Percy hitting the Lime Wagon in Ghost Train? And there is an argument to be made there. However, the key difference is that this isn't the climax of the story. If you break Ghost Train into three acts, this would be about the end of Act 1, start of Act 2. The Lime Cart acts as the build-up to the main event. 
So Topham Hat coming in at the last possible second in Step Me Gets Lost is the climax of the story, with no build-up towards it. They could have easily added a quick segment where the signalman makes a phone call and then Sir Topham Hat rolls up on the scene, or if they weren't bound to the 4.30 runtime, they could have done something more action orientated like having Stepney's crew return right as the claw grabs Stepney and he has to try to escape. That being said, I'm very well aware that this is a show made for kids, no matter what disclaimer in the description has to say about it. And an ending like this doesn't ruin the episode, it's just not great writing. In terms of presentation, ooh, this episode is good. As I said, Season 5 is, in my opinion, the best in terms of practical and technical effects. From the colors, to the lighting, to the camera angles, it's all wonderful. Seasons 3 and 4 have their positives, don't get me wrong, but I have to point to Season 5 as being the peak for presentation in the series. For narration, the UK dub got Michael Angelis, who at this point had been voicing the series for about three seasons now. I typically don't like Michael Angelis when it comes to spooky stories, since he likes to get very shouty, but I found he did a fine enough job here. His standout voice being the Ironworks twins, who give me goosebumps. Got you this time, Stepney. You'll make very fine scrap indeed. Buffer him, Bert. But compared to the narrator that the Americans got, well, it's no contest. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, give it up for Alec Baldwin. Oh, thank you, sir. Are these my cars? Only some of them. There's masses more in the sidings. Mavis was right. Suddenly everything does look spooky. This engine's not for scrapping. The grabber wasn't listening. I can hear Luke rolling his eyes now, but I really like Alec Baldwin's narration. Wash your mouth out with fucking soap. Like and subscribe! While his performances in Season 5 and 6 are vastly different with their own pros and cons, I think he absolutely nailed the spooky episodes. Like Michelangelo's, he knows how to ham things up, but he almost always plays it absolutely straight. And even in a show about colorful talking trains, I can appreciate that he wanted to take it seriously. And there's something about his final line in this episode that just makes me smile. Blue bells forever! Next up is a personal favorite of mine, Scaredy Engines. Original release, 2002. Hey, speaking of season 6, here it comes stumbling in like a drunk uncle on Christmas. It's Halloween on the island of Sodor, and Edward's gathered everyone around the turntable to show them this cool creepypasta he read about a haunted Sonic <laughs> Edward's gathered everyone around the turntable to tell them about a spooky ghost engine that roams the scrapyard, looking for its lost whistle. It's clearly enough to get the engine shaking, especially Percy, who isn't too thrilled about being sent to the scrapyard by Sir Topham Hatt. Uh, on a job, I mean. He didn't actually think he was going to be scrapped. We'll have to wait another two seasons for that brain blast. Thomas, seeing an opportunity to be a dick, teases Percy for being frightened, and only taunts him even more when they arrive at the smelters. Duck tries to comfort Percy, but the little green engine is still in a big huff over being teased. So, in typical Duck fashion, he resorts to the next best thing, fucking with his co-workers. Once the job is nearly complete, the foreman asks if one of the engines can stick around to help wrap things up. Duck volunteers Thomas's tribute, and though he's cocky at first, Thomas's smug attitude soon dissipates when he realizes he's... all alone. In the smelter's yard. And that ghost engine still playing on his mind. Thomas wished and set off an old steam whistle. The g, -g ghost whistle! Thomas takes off like a rocket, probably scaring the hell out of the foreman in the process, and tears off down the line. He soon overtakes Duck and Percy, who watch as the blue engine shoots past them and into the night. But when they get to the fireworks show, they find that Thomas is nowhere to be found. Duck takes no notice, the Cretan, but Percy is worried about what happened to his friend. He soon finds Thomas tucked away in the sheds, and the blue engine apologizes for being so cheeky. The episode ends in a very sweet way, with both Thomas and Percy watching the fireworks from their sheds. This episode is certainly a straightforward one when it comes to its storytelling, being very basic, even more so than Ghost Train. Season 6 is the series that started adopting more… and traditional tropes for their stories, and Scaredy Engines is definitely an example of that. I have absolutely seen this in some form or fashion in a cartoon before. While this was one of my favorite episodes for a long time, even I'll admit that it's certainly aged in a less than graceful way. A simple story is one thing, again, this is a show made for kids first and foremost, but the effects, both practical and special, are mixed. In terms of practical effects, this feels like a lost Season 5 episode. Season 6 looks its absolute best at night, and this is no exception. This shot of Thomas racing down the line is easily one of my favorites in the whole season. And the smelter shed? Oh, chef's kiss. However, it's in this shed where we see... this. 
Ugh, just this. Get it off my screen. This warping effect is the scariest part of this whole fucking episode just for how bad it looks. These shots would have been fine on their own, and while this might have looked good at the time and in a lower resolution, now it's just a distracting eyesore. If there's one piece of advice I can give to aspiring filmmakers, it's to not overcomplicate things for the sake of it. When you're messing around with special effects, ask yourself, do I really need to add CGI to Thomas's face here? Would Harold look any better if I remade him in Windows 98? What's the benefit to making Sir Topham Hat look like a Sims 3 character? And don't misconstrue what I'm saying here, I'm not some ultra boomer who hates experimentation and trying new things. CGI, interpolation, and other effects are great tools. But like with any tool, you need to know when to use it and how to get the most out of it before it becomes something useful. As a wise man, er, cartoon character once said, a hammer's a great tool, just not for washing your car. Anyways, that's enough bitching about a tiny detail that only one other person on the internet will care about. Let's talk about narration. Wait. Once again, we have Alec Baldwin and Michael Angelis at the helm. And... <laughs> uh... <laughs> well, these two are... Um... Okay, let me put it like this. It's like someone forgot to give Alec his morning coffee and instead put it all in Michael's cup. In season 6, Alec Baldwin sounds like this. Thomas, Percy and Duck. I have a special job for you. You want to collect some scrap from the smelter's yard tonight. On Halloween? And Michelangelo's sounds like- You are to collect some scrap from the smelter's yard tonight. On Halloween! I don't know what happened here, but it can make some scenes feel wildly different. That being said, I think between the two of them, I still prefer Alec Baldwin's narration, especially for this episode. He's got this smooth, gentle way of telling the story when it's time to be quiet, but he's still able to ham it up when the time arises. He's after me! I don't think you'll be late, said Duck. Michelangelo's isn't bad though, he's just way too shouty for this kind of story. We're not racing around in the jet engine, Michael, you need to calm down. <laughs> Overall, this episode, at least to me, sums up season 6 pretty nicely. On the surface, it's not perfect, it's got its flaws. But when you look for it, you can easily find something that can compete with what came before. And I think that's special. Speaking of things that are special, next up is Halloween, original release, 2004. This is something of an occasion for me, as I don't typically talk about the hit era of Thomas. Well, at least not on this show. And the reason for that is because, in comparison to the classic series and the later CGI series to a lesser extent, this era of Thomas is just sorta... treading water. The episodes are longer, but the story is much thinner. And it's a shame too, because while Halloween is nothing special from a narrative standpoint, in terms of technical production, it's absolutely wonderful. But before we can get to the dessert, we must first eat the spinach. It's Halloween on the island of Sodor, again, and Thomas has been sent to the scrapyard, again. But this time, he's accompanied by Emily. The two engines seem all brave and confident as they head down to collect some trucks, but as the saying goes, everybody gangster until they arrive at literal train hell. And who else is there but the ironworks diesels from Stepney Gets Lost, now named Aerie and Bert. The two mischievous diesels see the chance to play a prank on Thomas and Emily, and bump a line of flatbeds, causing the two steam engines to run in fright. They get all the way to the smelting shed, with Emily's expression looking like the face you'd make when you realize that wasn't just a fart, and she heads inside to get turned around, only for a big white tarp to suddenly and very conveniently come falling down on top of her. As any reasonable person would do, Emily begins running at full speed without being able to see what's in front of her, nearly clobbering Thomas as he runs out in fright, mistaking Emily for a ghost. They then run into Aerie and Bert, who also mistake Emily for a ghost, and the four of them begin racing down the main line at speeds that are definitely criminal in most of Britain. Granted, they let this thing drive around down there, so that might not be saying much. Oh no. Eventually, the quartet make their way back to Tidmouth's sheds, waking up all the engines and probably also everyone else in the area, only for the sheet to be ripped off Scooby-Doo style, revealing that the ghost engine is actually Emily. Oh shit. Later, Sir Topham Hat arrives, still in his pajamas, which is actually a really funny detail, and gives Aerie and Bert a scolding for, well, to be honest, doing very little in the grand scheme of things. Like, it's not their fault that Thomas and Emily are fucking idiots. I mean, after all, there's no such- Ah! A ghost! So, yeah, this story is kinda weak. Perfectly serviceable for the very youngest crowd it was trying to appeal to, but not great for the adults who no doubt had to watch this thing a hundred fucking times. However, that's not why this episode is special to me. No, what makes it stand out from the rest of Season 8 is the atmosphere. 
the fog, the camera angles, the amazingly smooth tracking shots, and the music. While it's nothing I can hum off the top of my head, thanks Robert Hartshorn. No problem play don't pause, it is me, the real Robert Hartshorn, back from the dead to hit the epic Fortnite death. The music that plays when the chase is on is chilling. Everything about the looks of this episode is great. In fact, I'd say it's on par with Stepney Gets Lost in that department. With this sequence right here being my absolute favorite. This right here, this is how you shoot Thomas, wait a minute. This is how you film Thomas. For narration, we've got Michael Angelis again, and he's pretty good, but I've gotta give a round of applause for Michael Brandon. In my video about Super Rescue, you may remember that I said Michael Brandon's dubbing would be perfectly fine in any other show, but in Thomas, he struggled to really grasp what made the other narrators stand out. And while the same is true here to some extent, he's got some amazing deliveries that go way unappreciated. They puff slowly through the piles of jagged steel and twisted scrap. Now if he'd just turned down the cartoony voice a little, he'd have had it perfect. That's no ghost, said Percy. That's Emily! Overall, while I'd still consider this a drop in quality for Thomas's spooky episodes, it still has great practical effects that really take advantage of the model series style. Now, how's about we leave Thomas Town for a little bit and shift over to a series that I've been meaning to talk about since my video on Brake Van. Next up is Ghosts, original release, 1989. Finally talking about a Tugs episode. Took me long enough, huh? For those who don't know what a Tugs is, firstly, I recommend you go watch this video by Usual Bloke Luke to get caught up to speed. Subscribe. But to summarize, imagine Thomas, but boats though. This short show was meant to be a sort of spin-off sister series to Thomas and Friends. One part to cash in on the popularity of that series, and one part David Mitten wanting to make things blow up, I'm sure. It's a series that didn't get very far, unfortunately, which, from what I understand, came from a combination of overambition, underpreparedness, and in the case of this episode, not being able to adapt to the restrictions placed upon it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with the, uh, the story. Yep, there sure is one of those. Oh boy, is there ever. A thick fog has hit the port of Big City, making it difficult to see what's what for the tugs, especially at night. And then, ghosts. Like, Immediately, no build up, nothing. And I think I can best summarize this story as Top 5 scary videos that will make you go arg. Because that's what this episode is. It's mostly the Star Tugs and Zorin, who's basically the diesel of this series, running into spooky white boats floating around in the fog, going arg. Climaxing with our two main characters, Ten Cents and Sunshine, seeing what looks like. Oh, okay, what the fuck is this? I'm sorry, I know this is supposed to be a plot summary, but what's this jerry-rigged rewind smoke effect? What is this, Batman and Robin? <laughs> this is what I mean about special effects being to a show's detriment if they're not used properly. I know there's a lot of fans out there who like Tugs, and I do see the appeal, but come on. You can't tell me that this looks good. And don't give me the excuse that this is just a product of its time. If they can superimpose the face into this shot and have it look okay, they can avoid doing this. It would have actually taken less effort to, you know, whatever. Not Thomas and not Percy sees what looks like King Neptune, which I don't know where or how they got that idea, but sure. They then rendezvous with the other tugs the next morning, where Ten Cents gives Top Hat shit about not believing in ghosts, despite also not believing Big Mac, that's this guy, when he told them about the spooky shit he'd seen the night before. Oh, Big Mac, you're not taking scuttlebutt stories for real, are you? I saw them, really! Silent! Phantoms of the sea! So you admit ghosts exist now, Top Hat? And in the last 30 seconds, we get an explanation from a character who I swear has no reason to be in the show other than to just act as the cool guy. Hercules here tells the other tugs that what they saw during the night weren't actually ghosts, but instead a group of boats from up north that were on the trail of an iceberg that had floated into their warmer waters. Said iceberg having the ship that Sunshine and Tencent saw frozen inside it. As for seeing Neptune, nah, they didn't see shit. That face in the sky, nope, just wasn't there. They were just tripping balls, I guess. This episode, man, its structure is being held together by toothpicks, and I know why it's like this, but geez. As I've been led to believe, the reason that this story and many others in Tugs feel so strangely paced is because originally, David Mitten wanted each episode to be a half hour long. That ambitious runtime then got cut down to 15 minutes, with some extended cuts of the episodes being put out as special releases on home media. Unfortunately, not every episode's extended cut got released, or was even available, leaving some of them feeling incomplete. In the case of Ghosts, I'm assuming they decided that the best way to cut down the runtime was to just chop off the beginning part of the episode where the plot is built up to. 
Pro tip for you writers out there, if you absolutely have to cut down your runtime, don't do it by removing the setup. Sure, we do get to the more interesting part of the story a lot faster, but it completely kills any buildup that the episode might have had. What's perplexing to me is that they could have totally fitted into the beginning and still had it work. All they had to do was reserve five of those minutes for Act 1, have another five for Act 2, and then have the big reveal take place in Act 3. And speaking of the big reveal, okay, I can kind of dig the idea that these boats aren't actually ghosts or anything. Though I don't understand how nobody was told that they'd be floating around in the dead of night when the tugs are clearly still working. Like, they even set up the idea that they don't have radar or radio, so if Hercules knew, he would have had to have been told, yeah? What, did he just decide to not tell the others? Wow, what an asshole. And second, to Ten Cents and Sunshine having just imagined seeing King Neptune, bull shit. What, did they also imagine the lightning striking the ship as well? Or the sparks jumping around it? What about the actual explosion in the background? Like, shit, if they imagined all that, what kind of weed did they smoke and where can I get some? Okay, so clearly I think this episode has a lot of problems, possibly more so than the others that I've looked at so far. In terms of story, at least, because as far as looks and sound go, my gosh, the presentation is the best thing about this show, and this episode, in fact. Everything here looks and sounds absolutely incredible. The world feels as real as real can get. <gasps> it's a train! Every inch of this set is detailed to perfection. The characters all look stellar, and despite wearing the same liveries, are very recognizable. I never found myself mistaking Ten Cents for Warrior or anything like that. The nighttime fog is calming, yet eerie at the same time. And the music. I'm gonna say it right now, this is some of the best music I've ever heard in a show like this. This piece only fully plays in this scene, and while the other spooky moments in this episode use the same jingle, it's incredibly haunting, if a bit repetitive by the time we reach the climax. There's also actual voice actors for this, which is like unheard of in Model Thomas, at least in English-speaking countries, and before Thomas and the Magic Railroad came and did… things. Ten Cents is voiced by Simon Nash. OJ taught me to wiggle, to keep the breeze on the same cheek all the time. That way you beat the currents, sailing in the right direction. Sean Prendergast plays Sunshine. Oh, oh I found our oh, numbers up. Oh, it is. They've come to get us. Chris Tullock plays Zorin. Hey, get lost. Not for 500. You'll be worth more as scrap. Top Hat is voiced by John Baddeley. Yo! Oh dear, oh dear. What? Oh no, I'm sorry. That's enough for me. I'm not moving from here till daylight. It's far too dangerous out there. And Sean Barrett plays Big Mac. I, I will. I saw something. I, I... Hercules. <laughs> I doubt you saw Neptune, Sunshine. He's for fairy tales. And to my surprise, Izzy Gomez. It's very foggy, but if I see nobody, nobody can see me. Mm. Which is just a crazy range of voices right there. And credit where credit is due, the voice acting is pretty good, with each character sounding distinct from one another, and more importantly, keeping their voices consistent throughout the series. There's no Duncan going from Scottish to Roughneck or Annie and Clarabelle having country accents for no reason. And though I'm certainly no professional voice actor, I think it's quite good. However, with that being said, the dialogue and sound mixing could use some work. Actors sometimes feel like they're making up things to say just to fill the empty space, and I counted more than a few times where I just couldn't understand what the characters were saying. I know they wanted to make everyone sound like they were actually at the port, and I respect the attempt, but if I can't tell what's being said, there's something wrong here. I've certainly seen this sort of adaptive voice acting done better, all while being crystal clear to the ears. Hello, I can move fast. Fog or no fog. Sawbuzz! Oh, God, no. Sawbuzz! What do you Where are you? You're looking right at me, James. What do you want? What say me and you take a break from shunting trucks and go pay Henry a little visit? This episode also isn't helped by the fact that, aside from Zorin and Izzy Gomez, the character interaction that Tugs is known for is almost entirely absent here. Overall, I think Ghosts is a pretty looking episode, with good music, but a story that clearly needed more time in the oven. I understand wanting to keep in all the exciting stuff, but even as someone who can appreciate some extra flash over actual substance, I've seen this kind of thing done better, but 
that's a story for another day. Now, let's take off the training wheels and get into the real meat of this review. The fan stories, starting with a double header. Next up is Night Train to Vickerstown and Revenge of the Ghost Train. Original release, 2016 and 2018. Once again, I'm crossing swords with T1E2H3, a YouTuber who needs no introduction, seeing as he's been on this show more times than Batman's been on Death Battle. <laughs> But I gotta say, this is probably the most excited I've ever been to take a look at his work, as I consider this to be some of his best stuff. Starting off with Night Train to Vickerstown, we pick things up with... Oh, fuck. Shit, were you guys having a party without me? So, right off the bat, things are in a pretty bad way. Nobody's dead, but there's definitely something afoot here. I mean, crashes are nothing new on the island of Sodor, but for something to knock both Gordon and Henry off the rails like this... Yeesh, whatever this is, it can't be good. However, for the first time ever in Sodor's history, an accident like this is being met with actual police investigation. Stop resist! One that, at first, proves to be a bit fruitless, as Gordon and Henry can't remember what the hell happened last night, and everyone who isn't Gordon and Henry either wasn't awake or wasn't there at the time of... this. The officer comes back a few days later to interview Gordon and Henry, whose memories are starting to come back to them, albeit slowly. Gordon walks the constable through what happened the night before, with everything being normal right up until they encounter a sinkhole in the line. A massive sinkhole at that. Man, this is tough work, but somebody's gotta do it. As they can't go any further, the engine and his crew reverse back towards the station, only to find themselves blocked by a tree on the line. That's a thick ass ball! Now trapped, there's only one thing left to do, Gotta call in the reinforcements. While a fleet of buses take the passengers home, Henry arrives on the scene with the breakdown train. But just as the men get to work clearing the line, a thick fog rolls in, and then... nothing. The two engines can't remember anything after that. That is, until they realize something. There's gotta be cameras on those coaches, right? Maybe they have some sort of clue. After about a week of specialists stitching the film back together, Sir Topham Hatt goes in to see it. The footage shows the guard on the train grabbing one of the portable cameras used to document, you know, crimes and shit. And finally, we're able to see what happened on the night of this accident firsthand. I find this sequence with the camera really effective for me personally. This first person shot is a great way of making the viewer feel tense. This sort of trope is used in a lot of horror games as well as some movies. And it's a great means of bringing us into the action, rather than being on the outside looking- ah, Fuck! Ah, oh, you dick. Jeez, and I thought the Fraps logo was going to be the scariest thing about this short film. Here, let me just... There. This is where we transition into part two, Revenge of the Ghost Train. As we saw in part one, the ghost that attacked Henry and Gordon is none other than Alfred. Hello there. One of the loaned engines who was sent to help out on the Fat Controller's railway, and later died trying to blow up Gordon and Henry. Needless to say, he's quite upset about the whole thing, and is more than capable of making his presence known. Oh my goodness! How did it get so cold, Oliver? Son. Oh, I'm sorry. Was my entrance a little too chilling? You can run, Henry, but you can't hide. Not while your and Gordon's fates are sealed. This is where things start to get a bit mystical magic-y, so hold on to your seats. We've been trying to contact you regarding your car's extended warrant- Sir Topham Hatt, obviously at a loss for what to do here, begins looking into ways to vanquish the ghost. But as it turns out, help ends up finding him. He's approached by a man named Nathan W. Rogman, which, while writing this, I realized his initials are literally NWR, which, I don't know if that was intentional or not, but if it was, very clever. Not sure I forgive you for the jump scare, but credit where credit is due. Anyways, Rogman comes to Sir Topham Hatt with an idea on how to capture the ghost, using, of all things, a tea kettle. That's the stupidest bullshit I've ever heard! But not just any tea kettle, a magic tea kettle. Now, typically when someone offers me a magic anything, my first response is to alert the authorities that there's a dealer in the area. But apparently this kettle's the real deal, having been used to seal away another ghost engine a long time ago. No, I'm not going to explain what's going on here because, come on, we're already 15 pages of script into this thing and we're not even halfway there yet. Not having many options at his disposal, Sir Topham Hatt agrees, and the two head off to the Scarloey Railway to find someone who knows where this kettle might be located. With the Fat Controller proving his title useful, so to speak. Speak. 
One small detail that I like here is how the kettle gets itself involved with all four railways. It's found in a lake near the Arsdale Railway, gets used to trap a ghost on the Caldy Fell, is dumped in a mine on the Scarloe Railway, and is now being used on the NWR Railway to catch another ghost. It's like poetry, so sort if of they rhyme. With the kettle in hand, and definitely not full of narcotics, the two men head back to the station where they meet up with Gordon and Henry. They need to hit old Alfie with some speed if they're going to cram him in there, and so they devise a plan to face off with the ghost, two against one. Though, not without some hesitation, seeing as Alfred can do this, and they can't. Well, we're bone. When night falls, Gordon, Henry, Sir Topham Hatt, and Rogman head off down the line in search of the ghost train. Another detail that I really like about these two stories is where they primarily take place. The Brendam Branch, not far from Wellsworth. The same place that Alfred first attempted to kill the two bigger engines way back when. And just like before, Alfred shows himself, albeit with less blood and jump scares than before, thankfully. Gordon and Henry put up a decent fight against the ghost, but Alfred is just as powerful as he was before, and is easily able to get the upper hand. And just when he's about to finish Gordon off... So, you won't stay dead, eh? Croven arrives on the scene, glaring daggers into his former friend. He's now able to see Alfred for what he really is, a hateful monster of an engine. Why, you wretched little ingrate! Yeah, no, fucking say it again, you suck! It's honestly really cool seeing a tertiary character like Croven standing his ground against someone who just did this to Henry, especially considering that he was basically Alfred's right-hand man when they arrived on Sodor. Now, how he knew where Alfred was, or the plan to capture him, or... Anything about all this, that's never explained. But that aside, I can appreciate adding him in as the fake-out last stand against the Spectre. And despite being just as powerless as the others, Croven is able to provide just enough of a distraction for Sir Topham Hatt to quite literally seal the deal, locking Alfred away in the kettle for... forever, I guess. Thus, ending the story. This duology, to me at least, encapsulates a lot of what T1E2H3 is known for. His series isn't flashy or telling some super sophisticated story or anything, and it definitely has its moments both visually and sound-wise. It took him over an hour to get ready. But there's this raw, unrefined creativity behind it that just makes it fun to watch. I do think part two is a little bit wild compared to part one, and of the two I'd probably recommend Night Train to Vickerstown before Revenge of the Ghost Train if you're looking for something genuinely spooky. Plus I also just think part one is better paced. But even still, being silly isn't necessarily a bad thing if that's what you're going for. And I do think, to an extent, it nails that on the head. Don't get me wrong, I love when something spooky is played straight, but there is a line. And I'd rather be laughing at something that is intentionally funny, rather than something that's trying to be serious and making me giggle by accident. That last one happens more often than you think. Thankfully, that wasn't the case here. Instead, these two parts struck a fairly good balance between serious and silly, and are overall some of T1E2H3's best. At least in my opinion. Next up, Engine 17. Original release, 2015. Looks like I'm popping two cherries for the price of one today, as I'm finally, finally able to talk about a story from the Jimmy the Ginty series. Tugs may have been a show I was interested in diving into, but I've been wanting to talk about Jimmy the Ginty for so long it hurts. This series was created by DCG12B, and is something of a classic from the early days of YouTube. It's not a meme series like, say, Tommy Thomas and Friends, but is instead a full-fledged show that, looks aside, is actually a favorite of mine. And what better way to jump in than with the episode that first introduced me to the series? Which is also a ghost episode. Huh, sensing a pattern here. Well, unlike Ghost Train, this episode's got tons of meat on its bones. Along with a whole cast of characters who... Fuck, I don't have time to introduce you to all these guys. So for now, the only ones that you need to know are Jimmy and Fred. The episode starts with Jimmy speaking to a young train spotter, who asks the tank engine if he knows someone who wears the number 17. Jimmy ponders on it for some time and, unable to think of such an engine, assumes the boy was playing a prank on him, of which he vents to the other engines back at the sheds. However, the mood quickly changes when Fred explains that there is, or rather, was an Engine 17, said engine having worked at the yard long before the others had arrived. He was a prototype design, not far off from Thomas's shape, but his work ethic was pathetic, and mechanically he wasn't all that great either. Worse still, he'd often try to wander out of the yard and onto the main line by himself. Really, comparing him to Thomas isn't too far off, though where Thomas's attempt to run free without his crew would, at worst, result in him falling in a hole, for Engine 17, his fate was more... grisly. 
Whew, that cut right there is so perfectly done. I don't love jump scares as a payoff for a spooky thing. They certainly can work if it's right at the end of the story, like, say, with Paranormal Activity. <clears throat> but they do have diminishing returns. You'll absolutely get the viewer on their first time through, and maybe you'll even get them to jump the second time around. But overall, I feel like jump scares can diminish the actually scary stuff if done too much, or when used too close to what you really want to scare the viewer with. That's one sexy ass beast. What a jump scare should do is keep your viewer paying attention, keep them on edge, but never truly show your hand to them. Rolling Thunder is a good one as it's a sharp, loud noise, but isn't inherently scary. And this quick cutaway here does exactly the same thing. It doesn't show anything scary per se, but it keeps the viewer from spacing out during the exposition. The fact that we don't see the crash leaves it up to our imagination, which again is very effective storytelling. While also being a clever way of, you know, keeping your models from looking like this. The rest of this episode is fairly similar to Ghosts, except instead of seeing nothing, the engines are actually encountering the ghost of Engine 17, who gives the mainline engines a good scare before arriving at Houston Station to see Jimmy, who is by far the most shaken up by the Spectre's appearance as he plunges into the night. Back at the sheds, the other engines tell Fred about what they saw last night, and the Elder Engine decides to take matters into his own hands. What's he gonna do, have a airway sounds? Yes. That evening, he volunteers to do Jimmy's work at the station, and soon enough, he too is visited by the ghostly Engine 17. But unlike his friends, Fred is able to hold his ground. This petulant behavior must stop. I want you gone from this railway. You are banished. Never return. Engine 17 began to growl. Get the hell out of here. With that, the ghost disappears into the night, and Fred returns to the sheds, reassuring Jimmy that they won't be seeing Engine 17 ever again. However, Jimmy isn't so sure. <laughs> Anyways, music aside, that ending is incredibly solid, as is the rest of the story. This was one heck of a way to be introduced to a fan series, and I'm happy to say that this episode is anything but a flash in the pan when it comes to quality. And despite the fact that the sets for this series are obviously very bare bones, I'm way more invested in what's going on here than I was with Tugs. I've said many times in the past that less than stellar visuals can be made up for if the other elements of a video pick up the slack, and Jimmy the Jinty is a prime example of that. I'm not saying the people who pour their blood, sweat, and tears into making sets that look like this, models that look like this, and shots that look like this are wasting their time. Far from it. But I will say that in spite of not having the style of those other creators, DCG more than makes up for it with the substance his series provides. This episode is especially helped by the fact that it's mostly shot in a night setting, which definitely helps hide the fact that this is totally just a bed frame that these tracks are sitting on. The shots on display here are really well done too. There's a lot of angles here that feel like they were taken right out of the original classic series. It's overall very impressive how much he's been able to do with so little. There are a few instances where the faces clash with the camera angles, as they're cut out with paper rather than being sculpted for each engine, but most of the shots are done in a way where it's very difficult to notice, so I won't harp on it too much. In terms of music and narration, well, the music is stripped right out of the original series, with the sound effects coming along for the ride, which is what it is. Keep in mind this was at a time where we didn't have people literally deconstructing and remaking every song and sound from scratch, so a limitation like this is pretty understandable. The narration, however, is... wonderful. Sure, there's a couple of moments where things sound a little poppy and clicky, which I will still critique to an extent, but in terms of delivery and writing, everything flows very smoothly. The pacing is on point, nothing here feels like it drags from one segment to the next, and the read is nearly flawless. Whoa, boy, what are you doing? He exclaimed. He nearly went through a red signal. His engine 17. He's after me, panted Terry in alarm. Calm down, old boy. Calm down. Calm down. I'm about to be steam fried by some nut job ghost and you're telling me to calm down. He didn't make it exactly 17 minutes long though, so... Next up, Silent as the Grave. Original release, 2021. Just when you thought DCG was in the clear, here I come to drag him back kicking and screaming like he's in Tale of the Dead Man's Float. 
For real though, I thought it would be a fun point of comparison to see how one of his older videos compared to something more recent. The stuff that you can do with trains is leaps and bounds more advanced than what we could do back in 2015, and I think this story is a perfect example of how far we've come in that time. This episode acts as a sort of sequel to Ghost Train, with Percy teasing Thomas about being frightened over his little prank. Thomas retorts, telling Percy that he would shit bricks if he actually saw a ghost, before making mention of something spooky up in Farquhar Quarry. Toby intervenes, strongly advising Thomas not to fucking go there, but in typical Thomas fashion, he forgoes all warning in hopes of getting his own back at Percy. He tells the tale of how a tank engine used to work at the mines long before Mavis arrived, and how a careless workman had sent the poor engine careening into one of the mine shafts. Nice job, you fucking dick. Apparently, the little engine is said to still roam the yards, looking for the workman who sealed his fate. I guess he never checked the unemployment line, considering I doubt that guy would have a job after that, but that's beside the point. The story is more than enough to scare Percy, who goes asking Mavis if it's really true. Mavis, who earlier in the episode had been told never to ask about the ill-fated engine, is about to say that she's never seen or heard anything about a ghost, when the freight cars behind Percy start moving by themselves. The Diesel quickly snaps out of her trance and kindly tells Percy that there's no ghost in the quarry, though for the rest of the day, she's not even sure if she believes her own words, especially as she sees the truck seeming to glide along the rails on their own. That night, Mavis is unable to settle down, and then... A tiny tank engine comes thundering through the fog and down the line. Just as quickly as Mavis sees it, it disappears without a trace, as if it's heading somewhere. Somewhere... specific. We then cut back to the branch line engine sleeping in their shed, when suddenly Thomas is awoken by the sound of someone coming, uh... Let me reword that. Thomas is awoken by the sound of another steam engine approaching. But before he can even process what's happening... The next morning, Percy and Toby wake up to find that Thomas is nowhere to be found. A workman walks over to Toby's driver, and the tram engine's face goes pale as he realizes what's going on. He tells Percy to take Thomas's coaches before heading off to the yards. He finds Thomas in the back of a siding, shaken from whatever he's just experienced. And that's when Toby explains the final part of the story, the part Thomas didn't know about. Whoever tells the story of the quarry engine in full is visited by the ghost himself. You were lucky. Must be because you're an engine. If it wasn't obvious, I think this is a fine step up from Engine 17. You can tell with this story, as well as the other entries we're looking at, that there's a certain passion that comes out when making spooky episodes. There's really not too much I'd critique here, save for a little bit of peaked audio here and there, but that's really it. The only other tiny nitpick I could think of is making the ghost trains charge at Thomas a little bit faster to invoke more of a sense of fear. Not like jump scare fast, but a little bit faster. But at the end of the day, this is still a great story from DCG 12B. It looks great, sounds great, and has an ending that genuinely gives me goosebumps. But whoever tells the ghost story will surely receive a visit from the quarry engine. And now I've told you, he'll be after me next. What? Bro, I'm hardened at this point. I'm like a metapod. <laughs> next up, A Part of Me Stayed Behind. Original release, 2023. Right, so this is a bit of an interesting one, as this is one of two stories on the list to not have a definitive version from what I could find. What I mean by that is, Richard Jordan, the guy who wrote the story, didn't make a video to go along with it as far as I can tell. So instead, I've decided to go with the adaptation made by Mr. Sands the Black Adder, as this one piqued my interest the most. We start things off with Gordon resting in the shed, not long after the events of Down the Mine. But the big engine feels... unlike himself. Like that memory of being at the mine isn't real. Shrugging the feeling off, Gordon goes back to sleep, only to have a... distressing dream. He sits there, floating in a black abyss, and when he looks down, he can see a collapsed mine shaft beneath him. And it feels as though the hole in the ground is pulling him in against his will. Oh, and also, right before the scene ends, you can totally hear the healing effect from Earthbound tossed in there, which... Fuck, I need to touch some grass. 
Huh, that's weird. It was summer when I started working on this. The next day, Gordon meets Thomas at the junction, and it turns out the tank engine has been having a similar dream, coupled with the same feeling of being unable to remember what happened at the mines. The two engines agree that there's only one thing to do. They have to get to the bottom of this. That night, Thomas and Gordon travel up the branch line to the mines, only to spot a... foreboding sign. Danger. Collapsed mine ahead. Their crews decide to investigate, only to return moments later insisting that they go back. However, true to his character, Thomas resists and heads towards the mine shaft, only to stop and see something truly disturbing. Hello? Is this Among Us? Two engines lay in the shaft, one looking nearly identical to Thomas, and the other very closely resembling Gordon. The two engines are at a loss for words when a voice calls out to them. It's Sir Topham Hatt, who seems quite distressed at what the two engines have discovered. They ask him what all this is, to which the fat controller sighs and begins to explain. The two engines in this pit are, or rather, were, Thomas and Gordon. We're treated to a flashback scene of the events, where we see Thomas, complete with his model from the Down the Mine pilot, fall into the shaft. Gordon quickly arrives on the scene, bearing a similar prototype design, but as he tries to pull Thomas out, the mine collapses even more, swallowing him as well. The two engines stare as Sir Topham Hatt pauses, before asking the obvious question. But how, how can we be here if we're down there? It's a gruesome tale. We had a major scandal due to our lack of judgement. And to save face, we saved your faces. As it turns out, both Thomas and Gordon's personalities were moved into new shells, not dissimilar to what likely happened to Henry, and they were given a second chance. The story ends with the two engines heading home, having to accept the fact that they must leave a part of themselves behind, rotting away in the abandoned mines. The car's extended warranty for quite some time now. I absolutely love this story. Richard Jordan is known for his more mature tales, and this is certainly no exception. The dialogue, the build-up, the existential dread, it's all there. While at the same time not being so dark as to alienate the viewer. And this particular adaptation is quite good, if not a bit overly ambitious. Let's get the obvious presentation issues out of the way. The camera's a little jittery, the wheel slip doesn't look quite right, there should be an ease-out keyframe here and here. The music at the climax is, I think, a little too triumphant considering the circumstances and, uh, junction. However, I think that what this project does get right more than makes up for it. Aside from the few blips I mentioned earlier, the editing is incredibly solid. The dream sequence with Gordon is super surreal, with the music complementing it perfectly. The same can be said for the flashback, which incorporates narration from the original episode, adding to the uncanniness of the story. And while these are older models, I think they too add a little something special here. It's hard for me to describe, but they just help the video stick out in my mind more. The narration this time around was done by Narrowgage, and it is the icing on the cake. His voice and read are as smooth as silk. None of the lines feel wonky or like they weren't read properly, and I don't recall hearing a single bit of peaked audio. At least, nothing that was noticeable. And while I'm not giving them a proper review, I would also like to make mention of two other adaptations of this story. One by Casper B12, and the other by Dan the Blue Tank. All three of these are great with their own strengths, and I highly recommend checking them out. Next up, The Half Engine. Original release, 2022. This is the other story that didn't have a definitive version, or at least not one that I could review. The original is on YouTube, but it's an audio drama, and, well, I mean, it's kind of hard to do a review on a story with just one static image. Haha, <laughs> me from the future here to say that this isn't the original at all. It's actually written by this person. Gosh, I love getting jebated. So once again, I decided to go with an adaptation done in trains, and I knew exactly which one I wanted to look at. This next one comes courtesy of the Bogey Boy. We start with James as he's returning home from a long day. A thick fog has descended on the island, making it hard for the red engine to see. And so he and his crew don't realize that they've been switched on to a disused line. As they begin to stop, James spots something in the distance. Something that- Ooh, shit. Well, that's not good. James quickly races back down the line and returns home looking like he's just seen a ghost. 
The other engines ask him what's wrong, and he explains that he just saw an engine that was cut perfectly in half, right down the middle. Gordon tries to dismiss the idea, saying that James must have just been seeing things when Thomas speaks up. The little engine knows something that the others don't. The engine James saw wasn't just by happenstance. No, this was caused by the half engine. I guess everyone has their own- You are so full of shit! Yeah, it sounds a little ridiculous, but stick with me here. Thomas tells the others about an engine who used to work on the railway long before it was owned by the Fat Controller. An engine that, well, needless to say, wasn't quite put together properly. Only having half a face, which looks like, geez, who fucked that up? I mean, the model looks great, but my gosh, that looks painful as hell. As you can imagine, having half a face makes basically everything a living nightmare for the tank engine. She can barely speak, repairs put her in immense pain, and other, less friendly engines are… well, I think cruel would be an understatement. Look at this dick, you can't tell me he doesn't get off on this. Because of all this, the half engine is rightfully incredibly testy, and treats everyone she comes across with disdain. It gets to the point where the fat director has to send her away, and purchases another engine to bring her to the scrapyard. However, we soon find out that in a do-or-die scenario like this, the malformed engine would pick the former and leave the newer engine with the latter. After that, she was never heard from again, though it's said that she still roams the forests at night, preying on anyone who comes across her. As Thomas finishes the story, Gordon huffs indignantly, and you know, rightfully so, Thomas did just essentially tell them that there's the train equivalent of Slenderman out there. The big engine discounts the story as more of Thomas's tomfoolery, Thomas foolery, and heads to sleep. However, the next night, while returning home with an empty train, Gordon can't help but feel Thomas's story play on his mind. As he travels home, his crew notice a red signal and bring the train to a stop. Gordon's driver, the fireman, and the guard all decide to head off to the next signal box to see what the matter is, leaving Gordon alone and- hey, g guys, what did I just say earlier in the video about leaving your engines unattended? Like, come on, this isn't a smart idea. And they even mention James's encounter with Jack Frost in this, so don't tell me this takes place before season- Regardless, the crew head off down the line, leaving Gordon all alone in the fog. However, he isn't alone for very long. <laughs> Stupid bird, go away! There's no such thing as the half engine. There's no such thing as the half engine. There's no such. When Gordon's crew return, they find the big engine shaking all over. Gordon tries to explain what he saw, but before he has the chance, the crew look behind him, and the express engine's boiler runs cold as he realizes that what he saw was real. Gordon returns to the sheds, still shaken up, and right away, Thomas knows what's happened. The half-engine not only proved her existence, but gave him a very real reminder of what she could do. And perhaps, she's not done with him just yet. What a fucking story. When I first listened to the original narration and watched the adaptation, I thought they were both pretty good, but going back to it now, dang do I love this one. I love the concept, I love the climax, and most of all, I love that the bogey boy was able to trim out some of the fat from the original. Not that the audio drama is bad, it's just a bit wordy for my liking. That's not its fault, of course. Typically, audio dramas are more verbose by design in order to give you a better understanding of what's going on. But this adaptation really cut out a lot of what would have been unnecessary narration, opting for more of a show-don't-tell approach. In terms of presentation, I mean, do I even need to say that this looks amazing? Because it does. The atmosphere is absolutely splendid. Everything is dark and foggy, but you can still see the action perfectly. Nothing feels like it gets lost in the darkness, and it all feels very well put together. In terms of narration, I thought all the voice actors did a good job. Some were definitely a bit quieter than others, which is a problem, don't get me wrong. But even then, I could still hear everyone alright, and that's what counts. The only two real complaints I have with the presentation are A, not being able to get a proper view of the half-engine's victims, since as grisly as it would be, I still think it would have been a great touch to show us the inner workings of the scrap engine and the coach's interior. Granted, this is more of a problem with trains, and these angles are perfect for letting our imaginations fill in the gaps, so it's not really a problem. 
And B, I found it a bit odd that Edward appears in the flashback, yet somehow still doesn't know about the half engine. It just comes off as a bit strange, though it's not enough to really take away from what is undoubtedly an amazing adaptation. The only other thing I would have liked to have seen is a little bit of closure for the half engine, since, well, it's technically still out there. But what we have here is perfectly fine on its own, and as a standalone story, it's awesome. And finally, All Eyes on Dennis. Original release, 2022. Our final entry for the night is another familiar face, Carson's Video Workshop. I've talked about this group and their work in the past, and as you know, I have a pretty high opinion of them. Over 2022, they made a good batch of stories for their first season of the Video Workshop, with this being their very last video of 2022. Let's see if they closed out the year on a high note. The episode takes place after the events of The Lazy Loco, and right away you're going to notice something pretty distinct. The narrator for this episode is taken a back seat, allowing the engines more time to talk. The narrator isn't completely gone of course, but it's enough of a change to tell your brain that something's off, while also not being so noticeable that it feels like the episode is lacking. The story itself is about Dennis, as the name implies, and Rosie. Two characters who were introduced in the hit era, and then discarded quickly afterwards. Well, I mean, Rosie had a brief stint in season 21, but that, that doesn't count, you know it doesn't count, they didn't do shit with her. Bleh. I always thought these two had the potential to be really fun in their own right. And, I'm happy to say that oh my gosh, yes, they totally are. We start the story with Dennis being his usual lazy self, crawling around at a snail's pace and leaving the yard in just the worst clusterfuck since my bedroom, which of course catches the attention of Rosie, who finds herself having to do Dennis's work as well as her own. She vents about the diesel to Henry, saying that he's one of the strangest choices for a big station shunter she's ever seen. To which Henry replies that while Dennis is the laziest and least motivated, he's far from the strangest. He recalls another tank engine that used to work in the yards alongside Thomas. He was quiet and never really spoke to the others. Still, he was a good worker, and Sir Topham had had hopes of buying him outright. However, the other railway refused to sell him, and soon the little engine was called away, giving a distraught whistle as he disappeared for the final time. We all felt very sorry for it. Holy shit, that is a clean transition. While a masking trick like this is pretty simple if you know what you're doing, it can provide some incredible transitions. Apparently, strange things seem to happen around the station when they're without a shunter. And while there's always a logical explanation for the goings-on, some workmen believe it's the ghost of the little engine wandering the yards. While Rosie dismisses the story as a bunch of fucking hoo-ha, it does give her an idea on how to whip Dennis into shape. As the end of the day comes, Dennis's driver is unable to move the Lazy Diesel back into his shed, and decides instead to just leave him there. Night falls, and Dennis begins to stir as he hears something moving in the dark. I love to inspire. Who's there? If I can just inspire one person, then I'll have done what I set out on this earth to do. Hit him with the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse dance. Oh, well, uh, what a nice surprise. Oh! In actuality, this whole sequence is a dream, but damn if it didn't throw me for a loop when I first watched it. In fact, I'd say it has some of my favorite cinematography of the whole story. The fact that the model for the ghost engine blends in perfectly with the darkness, save for the red highlights, really adds to the suspense here. And that close-up of its eye is exactly the kind of jump scare I was talking about back when we looked at Engine 17. As Dennis's nightmare continues, Rosie slowly sneaks up on the diesel, ready to give him a good scare. Dennis's driver returns, seeing the engine shaking but not noticing Rosie. And just when he turns the key, Dennis cracks open an eye and- HELP! GHOST! Huh? Get away! Get away! <sighs> oh, ouch. Yes. Ouch. The next morning, Sir Topham Hatt speaks severely to the two engines. Dennis, shaken up by what he saw last night, begs for another chance. Sir Topham Hatt agrees, but places Rosie in charge of keeping a watchful eye on him. Now, Rosie was meant to teach Dennis how to do his job properly, as she's seemingly the more experienced shunter. But as it turns out, Dennis is just as, if not even more capable, skittishly running circles around the tank engine. And it's here where Rosie starts to develop some respect for the Silver Diesel, and in turn shows him some kindness for all his hard work. But after a few days, she begins noticing that Dennis is pushing himself a bit too hard. And one night, after they accidentally give each other a good scare, she asks Dennis why he's suddenly a completely different engine. 
These little moments between Dennis and Rosie are honestly super sweet, made all the more so by the fact that we don't have the narrator chiming in every few moments to tell us how the characters are feeling. Character building like this should be shown to the audience, not told to us through some unrelated third party. And to go off on a tangent for a minute, this is something that I think the Railway series genuinely struggled with, specifically as we get to the Chris Audrey books. Now, I love the majority of Chris's stories, and I do sympathize with the guy being forced to can a bunch of ideas in favor of more Thomas-centric books, but there are a number of times where he decides to just brush past what should be pivotal moments for both character development and story progression. That's not to say Wilbur was any better, practically skating past Boko becoming friends with Duck, Donald, and Douglas, but the point is, seeing genuine moments like this where Dennis is actually able to confide in Rosie is, in my opinion, an objective improvement on the source material. Of course, Dennis doesn't go into too much detail of what he saw, but he tells her about the nightmare he had during that night at the yard. Hearing this, Rosie offers him a spot at the roundhouse for the night, and Dennis reluctantly accepts. Though, the big engines aren't as kind to him as Rosie has been. And not to be fooled by another Diesel, they tell Dennis to kick rocks. Rosie, not wanting to leave her friend alone, decides to bring him to the carriage shed. On the way there, Dennis thanks her for standing up for him. To which she replies, What are friends for, right? Friends? The two engines fall asleep in the sheds, but Dennis still has a lot on his mind. There's this feeling inside of him like he hasn't done a good enough job. And for a certain someone, the sentiment is mutual. Dennis once again finds himself eye to eye with the tank engine, who is not impressed that a lazy diesel has been given a spot, his spot, on the island. But just as the ghostly tank engine is about to exact its revenge, Dennis blurts out that it was Rosie who told him he could take a break. The specter stops before making a move against her. No! The place has never looked better. Great work, Dennis. There's a free spot in the roundhouse if you don't want to be on your own. He is really useful. He's been nothing but helpful all week. What are friends for, right? No, no, leave her alone. Shooting forward, Dennis clashes head on with the steam engine, easily overpowering it. He shouts that he's not going back to the way he was before, that he's changed, that he's gonna be better, and above all, get away from my friend. And just like that, the engine is gone without a trace. The episode wraps up with Dennis having turned over a new leaf and proving that he's not going to fall back into old habits. He's now a hard-working engine, and ironically, he actually enjoys this new life far more than his old one. And all because of one bad dream. But then, from a certain point of view, I suppose you could say it was a good dream after all. I think it goes without saying that this ending, as well as this entire story, slaps. This is, in my opinion, the best video that Carson and his crew have put out. It's a very long one, yes, but it never stops moving. Even in its quieter moments, it feels like the story is always going somewhere. And it takes the best elements from everything we've seen up until now to create something positively stellar. The pacing, the tone, the cinematography, the presentation, the perfect amount of exposition, the character interaction, the character writing, the use of a dream sequence, the appearance of a ghost, the threat it provides, and the showdown that follows. All while being ambitious, but at the same time not bending over backwards to make a circle piece fit in a square hole. Everything I look for in a spooky Ooga Booga ghost story is present here, and it's all so good. I love that this follows up on a previous episode. I love how the music manages to be spooky while staying distinctly Thomas. Up until the end, that is. But still, the piece that plays at the climax is amazing too. I love that it's quietly built up to the fact that Dennis is much stronger than the Marklin engine through his encounter with Rosie. I love when Dennis bears down and actually fights the ghost engine, something I haven't seen anyone try in years. I love the sets on display here, especially the coal mine which just shits on the Blue Mountain Quarry if you ask me. I love that they gave Rosie an actual job and a place on the island, instead of just making her random background shunter number 37. I even love the little detail of Rosie's paint getting progressively dirtier until Dennis has finally changed for good. It's all so triumphant and awesome and there's totally some spit in the audio here. 
Uh, never mind that tank engine. You might be the strangest engine ever to work here. And technically Henry's in the wrong shape here. Oh, fuck. And... Well, something's clearly gone wrong here with the blur effect. But for real, this is a fantastic piece of work that I highly, highly recommend watching. Really, everything that we've seen today deserves a look, both official and fan-made. Even the stuff I didn't particularly like is still a fun ride, and on Halloween, you couldn't ask for a better time to watch some spooky videos. In fact, I provided a playlist with a lot of them that you can find in the description of this video. I encourage you to give them all a watch, and let me know which one you liked the most in the comments below. Anyways, that's gonna do it for this titanic undertaking of a video. I hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye but you better clean Percy, or people will think he's a ghost. Do let's pretend I'm a ghost, and scare Thomas. That'll teach him to say I'm a silly little engine. This engine's not for scrapping. It's a good thing I'm visiting this yard tonight. Saving you from scrap is becoming a habit, Stepney. Please stop it. Nobody's brave all the time, but I'm not a scaredy engine. He's after me! The ghost, it's got me! The ghost is after us. That's no ghost, that's Emily. Oh, Big Mac, you're not taking Scuttlebutt's story for real, are you? Aye, well, I'm not going out there again till the fog lifts. Hello? Who's there? James? Edward? That better not be you, Thomas. It's about this, um, paranormal activity. I know how to put an end to it. A kettle? How is a bloody kettle gonna kill a ghost? He's gone. Calm down, old oh boy. Calm down. Calm down. I'm about to be seen fly by some nutjob ghost and you're telling me to calm down. He went right through Euston Station. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I'd hate to see how scared you'd really be if you really saw a ghost. These here were you. Shall we form an alliance? You help me and I'll help you. I saw a scrap engine. Well, it was cut in half. Clean through the middle without a fault at all. You must have seen a victim of the half engine. There's no such thing as the half engine. There's no such thing as the half engine. I had a nightmare the other day. A really bad one. Let's see if we can't lick the lazy lump into shape. And that's why I bumped into you. I was scared. I'm still scared. There's a free spot in the roundhouse if you don't want to be on your own.